uh, read together the acid base balance not just as it uh, concerns the renal system but also the regulation of the pH you have in your uh, in your blood uh, in your plasma with the hemoglobin also in the respiratory system as we covered before and the role of the lungs in uh, getting rid of the carbon dioxide and therefore it can lower it can uh, lower the acidity of your uh, of your blood so if we wrap this together um, the as we know from um, biology and early classes of physiology that the enzymes in your system require specific pH for operation. The protein folding of the enzymes and other proteins uh, will change significantly if the pH or the temperature uh, changes. Uh, so therefore the pH has to be regulated very tightly. Uh, the normal pH of the body fluid uh, approximately around 7.4 to 7 uh, the arterial blood is 7.4 uh, the venous blood drops a little bit because of the carbon dioxide in it so it goes to 7.35 and the intracellular fluid is around 7 you don't have to remember these numbers but you need to appreciate the fact that you can dip into alkalosis or alkalemia if your blood rises above certain level which is 7.45 7.5 and compare that to the margin of the normal arterial blood which was 7.4 you see that you don't have much of a wiggle room uh, between 7.45 and 7.35 that's the normal range anything above the 7.45 would be alkalosis and anything below 7.35 would be acidosis so it really had, has to be regulated tightly and we can't just leave it to be randomly um, regulated or, or um, just because how important the pH is to our system imagine all your enzymes all the enzymes that are associated with making your energy, making new steroids, making new uh, fatty acids that can help you with the cell membrane. Um, all these enzymes, the cytochrome enzymes that are needed for the oxidative respiration, everything can cease to function if the pH is um, it goes out of range. So no wonder uh, metabolic acidosis or alkalosis can be fatal if uncorrected. So let's see the mechanisms together how our body regulates these um, the, the acid-base balance in your system. Uh, we Most of the hydrogen ions are produced by metabolism if you remember from uh, the citric acid cycle and before that in the glycolysis we do uh, accumulate quite a bit of uh, free hydrogen ions and these hydrogen ions can cause you to have acidic uh, blood and acidic fluid so we need to start to regulate it um, in addition to the hydrogen ions that's liberated um, uh, from the oxidative phosphorylation oxidative uh, uh, respiration and from um, the process of glycolysis we also have phosphoric acid that can be from the breakdown of phosphorus containing protein. We have lactic acid from the anaerobic respiration. Uh, we have fatty acids and ketone. If you start to break um, fat uh, to generate energy, and if you do that in excess, for example, if you don't eat enough carbs and you are only utilizing fat to generate energy, then you can run into metabolic acidosis. Metabolic acidosis is more uh, common in patients with um, diabetes, uncontrolled diabetes, because they do use fatty acid as uh, acids as almost, uh, not entirely, but almost uh, the, the sole source of energy. 
and therefore you're breaking a lot of that and that can result into uh, accumulation of uh, ketone bodies and what we call ketoacidosis. Um, when we dissolve carbon dioxide in water, uh, we convert that into carbonic acid and that splits into HCO3 and yet again we have a hydrogen ion. So whatever the reason is, we do have a problem with the hydrogen ion and we do need to find a way to take care of it. The hydrogen ions uh, have to be regulated by a chemical buffering system that is fairly quick but um, and that's the, your first line of defense so sort of like when you are um, when you eat hot chili and your stomach is acidic uh, your first uh, instinct is to take some um, antacid or something that uh, can um, can break that acidity that's exactly the chemical buffering system that we have and we have a different chemical buffering system we have the proteins functioning as excellent buffering system. We also have the carbonate and we have the phosphate as a good buffering system in your body. In addition to that, the brainstem can sense through um, pH sensors uh, any changes in your uh, acidity and uh, or alkalinity and can regulate the respiration and when you breathe heavily then you are getting rid of more carbon dioxide and that can uh, lower the acidity of your blood because now you are getting rid of um, hydrogen ions that can be can uh, leave your uh, system uh, so the carbonate is is a very good system and we will talk about the carbonate in greater details but we talked about that part when we covered the respiratory um, system and we agreed before that people who are not breathing well uh, or having a problem in breathing they can end with a respiratory acidosis versus people who are um, having hyperventilation and getting rid of too much carbon dioxide more than you should um, you can end up with a respiratory alkalosis, not metabolic, because the reason here was the respiration, not the metabolic. So the long-lasting really is the renal mechanism that is the most potent, but it requires hours to start affecting your pH changes, and we will see that. So uh, strong acids, when they dissociate in the water, we know that they, they are strong acids because they give you plenty of uh, free hydrogens hydrogen ions. Weak acids don't do that. And the strong bases also dissociate easily in water and they quickly tie up hydrogen ions. These are chemi chemistry, these are basic uh, concepts of chemistry. A weak bases, they accept hydrogen ions um, more slowly. So with a chemical buffering system, you can use bicarbonate or phosphate or protein buffer system in order for you to um, disallow the, 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 the freedom uh, for hydrogen ions or the hydroxy ions and by forming uh, weaker acids or forming weaker bases instead of the stronger ones. And when you, when you are forming weaker acid, when you are forming weaker base, then there shouldn't be much free ions uh, like hydrogen ions, or there shouldn't be the weak base doesn't have that much thirst for uh, hydrogen ions, and therefore you can regulate the pH. So we will talk about these each individually. Let's start with the bicarbonate. We talked about that when we were uh, describing the physiology of respiration. We agreed that when we mix H2O with carbon dioxide, we end up with carbonic acid, which dissociates and gives you HCO3 and hydrogen ions. Um, it can buffer your intracellular fluid and the extracellular fluid. And, but it's only important in the, as extracellular fluid buffer. So if we add a strong acid to uh, HCO3, then HCO3 will convert into H2CO3. And that latter one can change into, can dissociate into H2O and carbon dioxide. 
and so you will have less hydrogen ions being free if um, if indeed the carbonate decides to form uh, a salt instead uh, or, or a form a salt with uh, a stronger acid so what you're doing here is you're tying the hydrogen ion remember the hydrogen ion here can swim freely because the chloride has uh, seven electrons on the outer shell and it can easily steal the electron from the hydrogen and therefore the hydrogen will be wandering very easily with this acid so but if you combine that with sodium bicarbonate and by the way sodium calcium carbonate is what you take as um, in, in with 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 uh, as an antacid uh, uh, to buffer your stomach acidity if you have eaten something or if you have too much acidity that's pretty much the the case here so we will form h2co3 and H2CO3, the salt from the outcome also would be sodium chloride. And the pH will uh, decrease only slightly unless all the available HCO3 in this case will be used up. Uh, HCO3, as you will see in the kidneys when we get to that, is closely regulated and uh, you will see how your kidneys are able to hold on or recycle the HCO3 or get rid of the hydrogen ion or keep the hydrogen ion as needed. If you have a strong base then you are with the HCO3 then again your uh, H2CO3 which is the acid it will form a salt with NaOH and therefore you are also regulating the alkalinity of your blood and your uh, blood pH is not going to rise dramatically. You have to remember as long as you are generating carbon dioxide you will always have H2CO3 and you will always be able to make carbonate ion and um, we, we cover that in the lung and we cover that in the kidneys and now we are uh, sort of wrapping it together we will talk about the regulation of the hydrogen ion and the carbonate in a very short bit but just for now the phosphate buffer works pretty much the same way you don't have to remember the details of this but it's nearly identical to the bicarbonate buffer in terms of buffering your blood and extracellular fluid now the proteins are unique because they have a COOH which is a carboxyl end and also they have an amine end and if you if your pH becomes acidic the amine end can receive an additional hydrogen so they can tie up a hydrogen whereas if it becomes basic the COOH and and the, and the proteins can donate the hydrogen ion to the solution and therefore it can buffer a basic medium so these are very powerful um, tools to buffer your um, buffer your pH um, again with with the, with the story of the the stomach acidity or the stomach burn uh, one of the good thing is to take for example low acid yogurt or to take milk because we know that the proteins in the milk will tie up uh, the free uh, hydrogen ions so it's it's a good buffering system to have the proteins again because it has both ends it has the carboxyl that can buffer a basic medium and it has the amine group which can buffer an acidic medium uh, the respiratory and the renal systems as we know are capable of um, helping out in the buffering of your blood the respiratory system can get rid of the carbon dioxide if you need to and when you do that then you will have less carbonic acid in your system and less hydrogen ions in your system because the carbonic acid or the carbonate which or the carbonic acid which is split now to carbonate and hydrogen can reform in the in the lungs to make h2co3 and the H2CO3 can split into CO2 which can diffuse out and water which has neutral pH. We also know that the hemoglobin is capable of binding uh, hydrogen ion and it, it binds the hydrogen ion when there is carbon dioxide 
and the minute the 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 blood is oxygenated we learned earlier in the respiratory system that your hemoglobin will give up its hydrogen so the hydrogen can tie to the hco3 which gets converted into h2co3 and the carbon dioxide then can leave in the lung so the respiratory system is a very powerful way to buffer your pH. So does the renal system. So here's what I was telling you about with the respiratory system. It eliminates carbon dioxide. And when you eliminate carbon dioxide, eventually you will affect this equation here and you will end up having less hydrogen ion. Again, during the unloading, as I said a minute ago, of carbon dioxide, the hydrogen also leaves the the, um, the hemoglobin, and it becomes incorporated into H, uh, HCO3, and that will split, and it will become H2O, and you get rid of the carbon dioxide in the air. So the respiration, as we learned uh, previously, it's it's a very powerful tool for you to rid your system from CO2. And therefore, when you rid your system from CO2, then you have the ability to um, maintain your pH and prevent acidosis. And it's no wonder that people with COPD or, or, um, or any kind of respiratory distress, are, uh, they have an acidic uh, blood and, or they have what we call respiratory acidosis. Um, so as I was saying, hypercapnia uh, which is a high carbon dioxide, we studied that in the respiratory system, will activate the medullary chemoreceptors and the rising um, hydrogen ion can activate peripheral chemoreceptors. And therefore you will play with those mechanisms, whether it's the breathing centers that you will start to breathe heavier or other mechanisms that you can use, for example, the kidneys to get rid of the hydrogen ions. But these are the respiratory regulation of the hydrogen ions, which is something we learned before when we got into the respiratory system. Now, alkalosis, as we also learned, uh, it can depress the respiratory uh, center, and then you have shallower uh, breathing and uh, because you wanna keep all your carbon dioxide. And as I told you earlier, if you have a hypoventilation or any sort of respiratory distress, you can end up with respiratory acidosis and the opposite is true. So if you get a patient and the patient has uh, acidosis and you wanna know if the problem he has is respiratory problem or metabolic problem, observe his breathing rate. If he's breathing normally or heavily, then it can't be um, respiratory acidosis. It's more likely, and if he's not blue, it's more likely to be metabolic acidosis. And the opposite is true. If he's breathing normally uh, and, or he's, he's, um, he is blue, uh, then that can, you know, can, can hint to you that uh, the problem is, um, is respiratory acidosis and not metabolic acidosis. So um, the chemical buffers we, we described earlier, they do not really eliminate the acids or the bases from the body, but they make the hydrogen ions less available. The lungs, on the other hand, they eliminate the carbon dioxide and therefore they eliminate the pH. The kidneys, they have tons of functions that can play with um, your pH it can get rid of the hydrogen ions, it can get rid of the ketones, which are ketone bodies, these are acidic. It can get rid of lactic acid, uric acid, but uh, any, any problem with the uric acid, by the way, can result in gout disease, which uh, if, you, if, you, if you heard that term before, where uric acid can start precipitating in, um, in, in the joints and causing a very painful inflammatory condition in, in the joints. At any event, the kidneys are capable of ridding your system from all these things and can prevent therefore metabolic acidosis. Uh, the most important renal mechanism is the conservation or the conserving the HCO3 
or excreting HCO3 if you don't want it. And we will revisit uh, this in the next couple of slides where it will remind you of, the, of, of how your kidneys are playing with HCO3 based on whether you need it or not. Um, the, the, you can also inside the kidney using the carbonic anhydrase, you can generate or, re, or either you reabsorb HCO3 or you can regenerate HCO3 and we will see how does that take place, which we visited before during uh, the, the renal system. Um, let's, let's have a look at the slide. Well, the slide is here. Okay, and then we will go back. It's easier to talk with some visual. So let's start somewhere um, with, uh, here is the HCO3 because this is, this is already a concern. HCO3, they can find themselves with sodium and now that you can take the sodium in as a sodium bicarbonate uh, through these channels. But that if you, if you actually do need them, but if you, even if you um, split H2CO3 and HCO3, you will, the result here will be hydrogen and this will make great sense in a minute once, once we go through this process on the left. We have hydrogen ions being secreted or excreted here, whether it's by antiport, if you remember from the renal physiology, sodium comes in and, put, and hydrogen goes out, or by active pump that, uh, that forcibly, forcefully uh, pushes the hydrogen ions into the lumen. Whichever the case is, now you have accumulation of hydrogen ions here in the lumen. But let's go back uh, proximally here where we had the filtration. If you remember back then, we allowed everything small enough to go through. And part of it was HCO3. HCO3 is small and it goes through along with sodium, along with other things. And now HCO3 here can combine itself with the hydrogen, which you kicked out, whether using the antiport here or using an active pump mechanism to pump the hydrogen. And now when you combine the two together, it will generate to you H2CO3. H2CO3 will split uh, quickly into H2O and CO2. Now CO2 can get reabsorbed because it is uh, soluble and diffuses easily through the plasma membrane and can get inside. And through the action of the carbonic anhydrase, you can form HCO3 one more time. And every time you do that, you will be kicking more and more hydrogen ions outside your system. And by kicking more hydrogen ions outside, those will be neutralized, whereas you are only um, recirculating the carbon dioxide, but not the H2O. So this is a great mechanism in which you can rid your system from the hydrogen ions, as you can see here. Now the fate of the HCO3, either it can come as HCO3 through specific channels, and that can also diffuse into first the interstitial space and then the blood, or as carbon dioxide, which also diffuses from here, from the cells, uh, proximal convoluted tubule cells, into the interstitial space, and then it gets reabsorbed by the red, by, by uh, your um, uh, capillaries, the peritubular capillaries. So the regeneration of HCO3 is a very unique system through which your kidneys can regulate the amount of uh, hydrogen ions. Uh, through uh, whether active excretion of, of uh, hydrogen ions and uh, the hydrogen ions are coming from somewhere. Uh, it's coming from the split of HCO3, uh, H2CO3 into HCO3 and hydrogen. But uh, when you make HCO3 and you only uh, and you only keep that and getting rid of the uh, hydrogen ion and that will become neutralized later on in the lumen, it's a very good way for the kidney, as you would all agree, how your kidney can indeed uh, neutralize your pH. Here is the same picture again, which we uh, described. 
And this is the text for what I just uh, told you um, earlier using the picture, how the carbon dioxide can, you know, can combine with the water in the proximal convoluted tubule forming H2CO3, and then HCO3 is formed and the hydrogen ions is either, if you need it, if you are suffering from alkalosis, then there is no reason to get rid of the hydrogen ions. But if your pH is quite low, then you will excrete that hydrogen ions either using um, your antiport with sodium or you can also use an active hydrogen pump into the lumen and that will be um, uniting with the HCO3 to form H2CO3 and the rest you already know from our review. Here is again the picture again to give you uh, another reminder of what's happening. Uh, that the H2CO3 is splitting it to HCO3 and hydrogen. And this hydrogen really, not it's not like all of it will go out. It really depends, do you need it or you don't need it. If you, if you need it, if you are, are suffering from alkalosis, then you are down-regulating those pumps and you are down-regulating those anti-ports, so you are keeping the hydrogen ions. But if you have acidosis already, then you are kicking more and more hydrogen ions away. And because the process involves making more pumps or less pumps or making more antiport, the renal regulation of the pH takes significantly more time than the lungs. Uh, the lungs, it was easy. You get rid of the carbon dioxide while you are breathing. But here it's involving much more than just diffusion. It involves the making of uh, uh, channels or pumps into the cell membrane in order for you to rid your system from the excessive hydrogen ions. Uh, and we saw how we are making the new carbonate. So, But the other mechanism in making the new carbonate is also by using the ammonia. And I think I have a picture for that. Yeah, I have it over here. But you don't, you don't really have to uh, remember this, how, how it works. But imagine the following. You have, um, you are losing... Uh, NH3, uh, which is an, as an ion, you are losing that here in your um, in your um, in in your filtrate, and that can combine itself with hydrogen ion forming NH4, and now it has a, a plus charge on it, and that can go down in the distal convoluted in the proximal convoluted tubule through the loop of Henle, and here we're going to play a little bit with it where the NH4 can be internalized. And if it is internalized, it will split into NH3 and hydrogen ion. And again, the hydrogen ion is capable of um, exchanging with sodium, as you remember, with the antiport, whereas the NH3 can be recycled. So it's, it's like it's not only you are getting back the NH3, uh, uh, and but you are also using the NH3 uh, first to carry a hydrogen and then you will use whatever you are splitting the hydrogen to eliminate it later on if you need to, if your body is requiring you to do so. So you can use this antiport, the hydrogen, sodium hydrogen antiport, but you can also use a, a co-transport which takes sodium NH4 and 2 chloride. That's a very unique uh, SIM port. And again, NH4 will come in and it will split into NH3 and the hydrogen ion and the hydrogen ion can again leave. So NH3 is, is, is very unique and important for maintaining your pH as well. And uh, it will come again to the same discussion we had before of people not eating enough proteins. So by default, they're not going to have nitrogenous waste. They're not going to have enough ammonia. And uh, they may be suffering from uh, metabolic uh, acidosis because NH4 or NH3, as you see here, is uh, very important in maintaining uh, or helping you to maintain uh, your um, your. Uh, pH of the blood. Finally, here in the uh, in the collecting duct, 
um, there is another unique um, system here where NH3 is being excreted but now it can get united with another hydrogen ion that is being actively secreted here and uh, then it forms to us NH4. So what I'm trying to get from this uh, picture here is that uh, ammonia is an important way uh, or imp important mechanism that is used by your kidneys to buffer your pH similar to the carbonate as we saw earlier on. So the hydrogen ions must be balanced and whether it's balanced by HCO3 or as you saw earlier by, uh, by NH3 which utilizes um, this uh, process to either get rid of more hydrogen ions or recycle the ammonia layer on and ridding your body from that free hydrogen. Um, there are specific cells for the, the buffering. We have cells in the collecting duct. We have two types of cells there that I really want you to remember. One of them is called the principal cell. And the principal cell, if you remember, that was the target of your aldosterone, along with the distal convoluted tubule. But the intercalated cells, they are the ones that are regulating your hydrogen ions. And we have two types, we have alpha and beta, but I, you don't have to remember the different types of the intercalated cells. But you just need to remember that the intercalated cells of the collect, collecting ducts are heavily associated with maintaining your pH of uh, your system by ridding um, your system of hydrogen ions or keeping the hydrogen ions in. And you saw the, the intercalated cell here. This is an example of an intercalated cell that is actively excreting the hydrogen ions. Okay? Um, Okay, so please do remember the intercalated cells and the, the principal cells and please do remember what each of them do for you in terms of sodium balance and also hydrogen balance here. So here are the mechanisms which we talked about uh, yet again but illustrated to you just in a different drawing. Again, here is the H2CO3 which splits into hydrogen and HCO3. And we talked about that, so I'm gonna I'm gonna skip through this. But just remember, things here are reversed. So here is the blood, and this is the urine. It's the picture. Is don't confuse yourself with this picture. This is the blood side, and this is the urine side, um, or the 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 luminar side. So um, if you are going to compare the pictures, just remember that this has flipped now to the opposite side. Okay, um, so um, ammonium ion excretion, we did cover that earlier, and it, it, it involves the metabolism or the breakdown of glutamine into H, NH3, and then H3 will form NH4, and we saw how NH3 and NH4 are very useful for you in uh, modulating the amount of hydrogen ions that you are excreting. Also, the HCO3 was very important, and they do cooperate together, the, NH, the NH4 and the HCO3, to modulate the amount of uh, hydrogen ions that you need to excrete. So, with the glutamate here, you, do not ha you don't have to remember this, um, this, this process. Uh, but uh, it does split into, uh, it, 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 it is deaminated and it gives you in 2 NH4 and also gives you HCO3. We know what happens with the HCO3, but we also know that the NH4 can be useful in, in carrying um, the hydrogen ion. But usually it is, in this picture here, it's depicted as the NH4 that's the one that's formed, but it's really the NH3 that's formed. And then it's only here that it unites itself with another hydrogen ion. So don't confuse yourself. Just don't go into extreme details here. Just remember the importance of the, the ammonium 
and the importance of the carbonate and how how does it function both ways in ridding your system of the excess uh, hydrogen ions um, and therefore can prevent you from uh, entering uh, metabolic or respiratory acidosis. Um, bicarbonate, we uh, we are we can actively uh, excrete it if there is alkalosis. Remember, if there is an acidosis, then we are excreting the hydrogen ion in the intercalated cells. In the beta cells um, of the inter the, the beta intercalated cells or the B intercalated cells, it is capable of secreting HCO3 if needed. And you don't have to remember whether it was the A cell or the alpha cell or the B cell or the beta cell. I just want you to remember that the intercalated cells are associated with uh, regulating your pH. And whether the regulation of the pH will be in uh, pumping uh, hydrogen ion to the lumen if you have acidosis or excreting, actively excreting HCO3 and reclaiming hydrogen ions if you have alkalosis. So the collecting duct, don't think of it as a plastic tube that is the final passage where nothing happens. In the collecting duct, there is a heavy regulation of your water volume by the antidiuretic hormone, and there is very heavy regulation of the sodium amount that you lose in the urine by the aldosterone, and there is heavy regulation of the potassium excretion. There is also heavy regulation of your hydrogen ions and the acidity. And whether you are suffering from acidity, then you will be um, you will be excreting hydrogen ions. Whereas if there is metabolic alkalosis in the intercalated cells, you will be keeping the hydrogen ions but getting rid of the HCO3. The other cell type is the principal cells and the principal cells they only play with the sodium potassium uh, uh, balance they do not take a, a, a role in the regulation of your um, if, of your pH so please do remember the function of the intercalated cells also the principal cells in um, in the excretion of bicarbonate or the hydrogen hydrogen ions Okay, so um, abnormalities, uh, if the problem, as we said earlier, is from the respiration, then you can end up with respiratory acidosis if you are not getting rid of the carbon dioxide in the, from the lungs as you should then you will get into respiratory acidosis and the opposite is true if you are getting rid of too much carbon dioxide you are hyperventilating for no reason then you are getting rid of too much uh, carbon dioxide and you can fall into respiratory alkalosis metabolic acidosis and metabolic alkalosis the reason is not the lung the reason is something else uh, metabolic acidosis has gave you an example of the diabetes how uh, you can get ketoacidosis easily from utilizing um, uh, fatty acids as the only source or the primary source of energy for you and uh, metabolic alkalosis is very rare but it can happen and it's it's generally associating some kind of bad metabolism of amino acids but you you don't necessarily have to um, remember that part so we did talk about the respiratory acidosis and the alkalosis when we covered together the respiratory system and so i'm not spending now time on it a respiratory acidosis and respira a metabolic acidosis and alkalosis uh, if the ph uh, imbalance is not caused by abnormal carbon dioxide but rather because of something uh, metabolic. The causes for the metabolic acidosis is either too much alcohol, uh, accumulation of lactic acid, ketosis, uh, renal failure, starvation, all of these will result in, uh, in, in metabolic um, acidosis. And remember when you have metabolic acidosis what happens in the intercalated cells they will get rid of HCO3 and um, and that's that's not a very good thing to get rid of the of 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 your um, of your HCO3 
um, um, but um, on, on the other hand, here I think they are trying to say something else. I'm sorry, I, I, I missed the cue. Um, if a person has a severe diarrhea, there he is also um, or she is uh, having severe loss of HCO3, and that can result in metabolic alkal acidosis because uh, you don't have. Um, the buffering capacity of the HCO3. The opposite is true if someone is vomiting too much, so uh, they are emptying their stomach. And that is a rare case uh, where you can enter metabolic alkalosis because you are getting rid of too much acid HCL from your stomach and you can fall into metabolic alkalosis. Uh, other reasons can be uh, metabolic disorder, which involves amino acid uh, problems. But nevertheless, you will have uh, an elevation of the pH, but it has nothing to do with your uh, respiration. So if you go in the pH below 7, that can cause death. And if you go above 7.8, that can also cause death. So you can see you have a very, very little wiggle room between 7 and 7.8. And you agree with me that uh, this, is, this is why we need to tightly regulate that system and not allowing the pH to rise or fall too much. Uh, in, in renal compensation, uh, when you have metabolic acidosis, then you're breathing heavily. And when you're having metabolic acidosis also, or any kind of acidosis, the kidneys will try to correct it by getting rid of the hydrogen ions as we, um, as we saw. So if a person has metabolic acidosis, what do you expect the urine to be? Very acidic, right? Because your, your, your cells and your intercalated cells and all your system is going to focus heavily on getting rid of the free hydrogen ions to lower your pH. So you expect very little HCO3 in the urine and you also expect a very high hydrogen ion in the urine and the pH of the urine will be very uh, acidic. Um, the, in respirat the respiratory compensation for the metabolic acidosis uh, for the metabolic alkalosis, sorry, is that you have an inhibition of the respiratory system the center because of the alkalosis, and that will result into a slow and shallow breathing, and that allows the carbon dioxide to actually accumulate. Uh, the renal compensation for your uh, alkalosis will be that you are getting rid of the HCO3, HCO3, uh, will leave in the urine and you will be reuptaking your hydrogen ions back in order for you to correct uh, your uh, metabolic alkalosis. Now, um, problems can happen during infancy or during uh, early childhood in maintaining regular pH, maintaining fluid and electrolyte and that can result from any of these causes that you see here in front of you. Um, you don't have to um, remember that part, but just for uh, it, it's for your entertainment. Um, if you have, if your lungs are not breathing well, then you are having respiratory acidosis. Uh, if you have a problem with the fluid intake and the output, you can also run into a problem with regulating your fluid balance or the pH balance. Uh, so these problems are known to affect mainly children that are very vulnerable to it. Whereas in older age, the total water uh, intake usually decreases and uh, uh, older people can suffer easily from uh, dehydration. And especially that the thirst clues in the hypothalamus and then the brain are sort of not very responsive. So they don't know when they're supposed to be drinking water and they can easily fall into dehydration. So that was a wrap for uh, our chapter in regulating uh, electrolyte uh, fluid and acid-base balance. Uh, as you can see, the kidney is playing a major role, but it's not the only player in maintaining your pH because the kidney takes quite a long time, a few hours to maybe even a day, 
in order for it to put in more uh, hydrogen uh, pumps or reducing the hydrogen pumps or reducing the hydrogen channels or increasing the hydrogen ion channels. So it takes a longer time and for, for the short uh, intervention you will use the chemical regulators such as the bicarbonate in your system to buffer any pH. You can use the proteins in your system. You can use the phosphate in your system. And then your respiration will kick in to also in an attempt to correct your pH. And then if it continues, then it falls into the kidney to regulate your pH. So it's a very exciting chapter because it wraps things together. It wraps also the water regulation. Uh, it traps what we learned about the antidiuretic hormone, the aldosterone, the angiotensin. It wraps mechanisms, how you hold on to the sodium, how you hold on to the calcium, how you get rid of the phosphate if you don't need it, and uh, what are the cues for holding into the sodium or the getting rid of the potassium. All of these things in this very exciting chapter because as I said, it, it, it wraps three or four chapters together. So it's a good review chapter for us because it, it can really um, tie this information in, in our understanding of the human physiology very well. I hope you find this uh, uh, lecture uh, helpful for you in your review. And um, uh, I hope you, um, you will take advantage of these uh, lectures and, uh, and best of luck. Have a good day.